Welcome to the Center for Global Development. I'm Amanda Glassman, the CGD's Executive Vice President, and it's my pleasure and honor to kick off today's event about ensuring an inclusive COVID-19 recovery through investments in cash, care, and data. These three words have really embodied so much of our work over this past couple of years, and they've come out of our gender team's work uh, that is funded by the Gates Foundation. Thank you so much for all of that support. Um, this gender and development initiative is led by our colleague Megan O'Donnell, who's also played a huge role in putting together this event and has focused on generating and synthesizing evidence on the pandemic's gendered impacts in low and middle income countries. We also looked at the extent to which donor institutions and policymakers were considering the disproportionately gendered impacts of the social and economic crisis that we've seen today. And most importantly, we sought to develop evidence-based recommendations for an inclusive recovery. And that's where investments in cash, care, and data come in. I'm thinking of a t-shirt. <laughs> Looking at both COVID and pre-COVID evidence on what works to promote women's economic empowerment and broader gender equality, the team's work highlighted the need to increase and improve investment in those three areas. So care, what do we mean? Investments to reduce and redistribute women's unpaid care work. Cash, referring to social protection, cash transfers to vulnerable populations and to women and girls in particular. As well as broader support to women-owned firms and sectors where women predominate. What do we mean when we talk about data? We talk about referring to an integrated gender lens into monitoring the impact of COVID response measures as well as broader data systems and the Data 2X initiatives that the Gates Foundation has also been really important. We're so glad that Minister Zainab Ahmed is here today, Melinda French Gates and Jennifer Klein to discuss what the governments of Nigeria and the United States are doing in to consider gender equality and to incorporate gender equality into the COVID response and recovery, as well as what else is needed to ensure that women and girls are not left further behind. For those of you joining us online, can you please share any questions that you have for the panelists over YouTube, tweet them to at CGDev, or email events at cgdev.org. So I'll now hand things over to Masood Ahmed, who's CGD's president, to facilitate the discussion with our panelists. Thanks. Thank you very much, Amanda. Thank you all for being here in person, and thanks to all of you who are joining us uh, online, and, and most of all, thanks to all of our panelists for taking the time to, to be with us. So after that introduction, I'm going to jump right in and then ask our panelists uh, for their thoughts, but then we will leave some time for questions uh, from you and from those online to make sure that uh, this is more of a a conversation that, that you can all be part of. And if it's uh, all right with you, uh, Melinda, uh, I'd like to start with you, please. Sure. And, and the question I want to do is pick up a bit on what Amanda was saying. The research now that we are doing, others are doing, is showing that the uh, economic consequences and social consequences of the pandemic and the recovery will last a long time and that they're going to disproportionately impact uh, women and, and girls. And I know this is something your colleagues at the foundation have been do, working on. You yourself have been thinking and writing about it. Uh, uh, but I wanted to get a little bit first your take on, you know, as you think about this, what's front of mind for you as you try to make sure that you can support an inclusive recovery? Thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, well, when I think a bit about, about the world right now, and I think about development um, over time, you know, I've been in this development community now for over 22 years. Shame on us. We made a huge mistake in the development community not to look sooner at women's issues. You know, these women's issues were often, so often kind of the nice to do, the side to do thing. No, they're the fundamental thing. When I look back over the last 22 years, you know, what has, when you think about countries trying to make transitions from low to middle to high income, it's investments in women and children that help make that possible. 
you know, why have we had such a decline over so many years in childhood deaths? It was Gavi. It was the vaccines that got distributed en masse. It was countries investing in their primary health care so vaccines could be distributed. Malaria deaths are another thing that came down substantially, especially for children, but because of the Global Fund. We invested in hanging bed nets, and mothers are the ones who make the decision of, you know, hanging it and who sleeps under it. So, you know, I think it's a gigantic missed opportunity that I wished, quite honestly, we had started to invest in as a development community and as a foundation 22 years ago. Um, I use that I use that time frame because our foundation essentially kind of came together and really got started in 2000. So when I look at the world where it is today, I see unbelievable innovations on the continent of Africa, ingenuity on the continent of Africa, some health systems that have been built really well. There's still many that are fragile. But if we don't take this moment of COVID, which is really been hard on families, on people, on finances. If we don't take this moment and seize it and say, look, this is the time to make investment in women, we are just gonna have a huge missed opportunity. So I think of, okay, if you, and this is why data is so important. When you look at the jobs, men have essentially recovered the jobs they had pre-pandemic around the world, right? Whereas women, lost their jobs at two times the rate and haven't come back. That's true if you're a high-income country like the United States or if you're a low-income country like a country perhaps somewhere on the continent of Africa or Southeast Asia. The other thing we don't look at is informal workers. Huge parts of these countries are informal work and it's how women get economic means, it's how they put food on the table, it's how they get their kids into school, which is their dream. So 80% of informal workers are women. And so we have got to make investments in parts of these sectors that will really bring women back into the economy with money in their hands because we know they make the right investments on behalf of their kids. It's a self-fulfilling cycle. So that's kind of how I see the state yeah. of the world right now. Now, I think the, the point about informal workers is so important. And, and that's what you were writing about earlier, I think a week mm -hmm. ago. Uh, because particularly whether you go to Nigeria or whether you go to many of the low and middle income countries, that is what most women are doing. So not only are most informal workers women, most women workers are working in the informal sector as well and, and they don't have much of the support structure and it's also harder to, to reach them. And, and I want to turn to, to you, Minister, if I may. And in Nigeria has been really quite hard hit by the pandemic, like many of the countries in the region, both in terms of public health, in terms of economic impact, deepest recession that you've had uh, since the 80s, uh, um, vaccination numbers still very low, with one in nine have had one dose, and fewer have had two. And, and now, um, as you see the job loss point that, that Melinda, you were making, Many of the women are precisely in the sectors that have been hardest hit in Nigeria. And we were just discussing before we came on the role of the finance minister, which is to juggle priorities mm. and try to see where to put the money. And I want to get a little bit your sense. How has that process worked out in Nigeria over the past couple of years? To what extent have you been able to focus on prioritizing uh, the, the impact on women of the pandemic and trying to see if they can be fully reflected in the measures to, that are, you're putting in place for the recovery? Well, thank you very much, uh, Masood. Um, it's no doubt that um, the the global pandemic affected Nigeria like it did a lot of other countries. But we also very quickly uh, put in place a number of measures that helped us to contain the health pandemic and also put in place an economic sustainability plan that helped us to manage the slide in the economy. So yes, we did go into a recession the deep, deepest uh, um, that we've ever experienced. 
But we also exited recession within just one quarter. And how did this happen? It is because the of the implementation of the economic sustainability plan. We did a plan that was centered around creating jobs. And while we were planning, we made sure to make a provision that each category of those jobs, at least 50%, would be for women. And this was tracked and monitored. And because there was that special attention, so apart from creating of jobs, we were also saving um, small businesses by giving them um, payroll support, small uh, grants, and then even small loans. And a lot of these small businesses are owned by women, so jobs were pr protected. Uh, we also provided household support. And one thing about support that goes directly to women is you know that it will be used correctly yeah. for the household, nothing, nothing else. So we were able to save uh, uh, jobs and also preserve jobs that could have been lost and protected the majority of the people from the effect of the health pandemic. The health pandemic, I'm sure Melinda knows, in Nigeria, the impact was minimal in the sense that we have still about 300,000 people affected, about 3,000 lives uh, lost. But that was so because we took uh, measures early, yes. including educating homes and women on just basic hygiene so that people are protected because we knew we had a healthcare system that was weak and not up to up to the task. So women played a major role in the hospitals, it was the nurses and the caregivers were women. In the homes, it was the women and the mothers that were leading the protection of their of their families. So um, we apart from the economic sustainability plan, also in in preparing our national plans and our national budget, there's now a conscious effort to even give directives to ministries, departments, and agencies that they need to uh, flag projects that are gender sensitive. So we had in our last budget circular provision to make sure uh, agencies are guided in making provisions for, conscious provisions for uh, funding for programs and projects that will be beneficial and we also are working on a tracking process to make sure that th at the implementation level that that actually happens. When we, when we uh, made the report and tracked the performance of the economic sustainability plan, all the targets relating to uh, the number of jobs to be protected for women and the number of jobs to be created were actually met. Were actually met. And um, the pandemic put a lot of children out of school. And we also found that the largest number of children that are still out of school are girls. So working with the World Bank uh, on that program that is designed to support adolescents, girls to go back to school and to stay in school, is a program that is uh, designed to upgrade schools that will enable or give comfort, enough comfort for parents to send their girls back to school. Because parents tend to take the decision, okay, if I have two children, a boy and a girl out of school, if one person has to go, it's a boy that goes and the girl stays back at home. So that's a major threat to the education of these girls. And the Agile program is not only designed to make sure girls go back to school and stay in school, but it's also going to be a program that will help us in our population uh, management. Because the assessment that we that has been made and research shows that once you um, uh, place a girl in school up to we call the secondary school level, so that's junior school, and she doesn't get married before then, then she will tend to be more careful about her health and uh, takes better care of her family and also starts having children later than than if she didn't finish uh, uh, secondary school. Yeah. Absolutely, and, and I, I just want to uh, say one thing on that point before I turn to Jennifer, and that is that there is overwhelming country after country that of all the kids that were held back from school for a year or two, it's the girls that are not going back in the same numbers and that is resulting in earlier marriages, earlier childbirth, and less health for, for them and their families. So I think anything that can be done to 
encourage that return back to school and keep them in school longer. You know, we CGD are just putting out actually in two weeks now a major report on girls' education. And the benefits of it go so much more than the sort of narrow definition of learning. And I think one of the mistakes, I mean, you, you started off mm -hmm. by saying some of the things we should have done 20 mm -hmm. years ago. I think some of the mistakes that we develop in community also made was in defining the benefits of keeping kids in school for longer very narrowly. Mm -hmm. You know, the benefits go far beyond. Learning is hugely important, but the benefits go far beyond that, and we need to account for that. Well, and a decade ago, we weren't even talking about girls in school. Right. It was only a decade ago that at the UN, we finally had a roll call yep. where presidents and prime ministers had to show up and say what they were doing on girls' education. Yep. And it benefits every generation going forward because she's not so young that her body's not ready to have a yep. baby. But she also, the whole way she accesses the health system is different because she's used to asking questions, she has knowledge. I mean, it, just, it, it benefits everything. Absolutely. Jennifer, I'm going to turn to you now, and, and I want to get a little bit of a sense now. You've sort of heard the, the two perspectives now, and it's sort of at the White House, the Gender Policy Council, and you're working on a range of issues directly and in partnership. I want to get a little bit of your sense of how have you been able to work with different agencies to ensure that girls in low- and middle-income countries aren't left behind in the recovery process? Um, thank you. Thank you for having this uh, really important discussion and for, for having me part of it. I have to start by correcting uh, my friend Melinda Gates um, because I think there's one thing you didn't say, which of course you wouldn't say, which is that because of you and your work, um, both through the Gates Foundation and Pivotal Ventures, you have actually been essential in making the case for why centering women and girls in development and in policy more generally. And there's a second piece, which is you know very relevant for today's discussion, measuring. Yeah, um, because as we've learned, we don't do what we don't measure. And because of your work, really largely your work um, and your investments, we do now measure things mm -hmm. and have seen the results and are now making policy choices even at the White House Gender Policy Council with those results in mind. So I want to start by correcting you and thanking you. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but secondly, to your, to your question, um, you know, the Gender Policy Council covers a range of issues. Um, we very proudly put out the first ever national gender strategy. There are gender strategies in other countries around the world, and we have never had one in the United States. And it covers 10 issues, um, and they're all interconnected. But if I had to say what we spend most of our time working on, and part of it is was a decision before COVID, and part of it is in direct result to, to the pandemic, um, are women's economic security, um, preventing and responding to gender-based violence, and women's health, um, including reproductive health, but not exclusively women's health. Um, and each of these, as I said, is both a foreign policy and a domestic policy priority, and each of these uh, has been affected by the, the pandemic. You know, we, we had a, a health crisis, and then we had an economic crisis, and then we had a caregiving crisis, and really throughout we've had this shadow crisis of, of gender-based violence. And so all of our work is dedicated to addressing really each of those. Um, you know, I would just toss out a few examples. You know, we, we work very closely with the State Department, with USAID, with M the Millennium Challenge Corporation, with the Development Finance Corporation, really all of the, ar the Treasury Department, really all of the arms of the, um, of the uh, government um, to, to do a bunch of things. Um, I'll, I'll start with vaccines. Um, you know, we wanted to uh, ensure that both in the United States and in low and middle income countries, people had access to vaccines. Um, that was, you know, a huge focus of the American Rescue Plan, um, which got 1.2 billion doses um, out uh, and into the world um, so that people could get their shots in arms and get back to work and get back to school. Um, and also more generally a focus on, on equitable delivery of vaccines, but also other health services. Um, because as we've already started talking about, you know, building that health system or ensuring that, that the health system, which, you know, there's been years of work on building uh, in the last, you know, decade or so, um, that is essential to delivering the, the health services that we need to, to, uh, to get people um, vaccinated and, and get the services they need if they are ill. Um, 
And then I would also point to, you know, supporting the essential workers, which again, we've already started work uh, talking about, which as you noted, are the women. So whether that's informally in unpaid work or whether that's informally, um, you know, even here in this country, women, largely women of color, are those essential workers in the healthcare field, in the childcare field um, that are essential for getting people back to work. Um, and so, you know, that has been a big focus of what we're doing in the, in the United States government. Um, Great, I think I'll, I'll come back to you on, on some of that in a minute. Uh, <coughs> but I want to get to think a little bit about sort of we are now at this point, we're looking forward. And, and I guess the question in my mind, and again, if I might start mm. with uh, you, Melinda, is uh, to what, what, based on the evidence, based on what you're seeing and talking to with your colleagues working in many, many countries, what are the investments that you think the foundation, others, governments, IFIs, the international financial institutions should be prioritizing and also you're exposed to the work that is underway in many, many countries. Mm. Are there any good examples, good initiatives, success stories that are worth sharing, which others can then take away? There, there are many yeah. success stories in Southeast Asia and across the continent of Africa. And I think you're exactly right. We need to look at those and we need to help scale them up. But let's just start with, okay, a robust economic recovery after all the scarring that's happened from COVID. And I'm sure the minister is probably going to talk about, I mean, the debt problem is, yeah, yeah. is substantial, right? But you've got to, the financial institutions need to step up, up. So Ida did raise $93 billion at the end of last year. And they are looking at their money through a gender lens that as those grants and loans go out to countries, how can we help women get back into the economy? So the whole reason we use this framework of cash, care, and data is because cash, when a woman, when a woman or a man has cash in their hands, we know, as the minister said, a woman spends it on her family. She spends it on the kids' health. She spends it on better nutrition. She spends it on their schooling. So during COVID, Many countries saw that one of the best responses they could do was to take these digital bank accounts and when they had the data to say these are the ones that are you know, owned by women in their hands, they put cash transfers into those places in a woman's hands because they knew she would help sustain the family and the community. Uh, it was done in Togo at scale. It was done in India. It was done, there was a social protection scheme in Brazil. Mexico's done this for a long time. So we have the data to know. The other thing I would, to know that that's important, cash in somebody's hands. I mean, let's be honest, money is power. Women will tell you all over the world, when I have a few extra dollars in my hand, if I'm in India, my mother-in-law looks at me differently. If I'm in Southeast Asia and I can do something for my son, buy him a bike, he looks at me differently. Women in Africa will tell me, everybody in the community looks differently at me because I can loan out a little bit of money. So cash is fundamental in women's hands. Number two, and digital, we didn't have this opportunity right. of digital seven years ago, and now we do. Targeted digital, where you lay down the right regulatory environment, the right open source backbone, and you get cash transfers and digital wallets into people's hands. The second thing I would say is care. We don't look at care, and yet what is it that pushed women out of the labor force in country after country after country? It was care. Care for their children and care for our elderly parents. And you cannot work, it's very difficult to work when you have a young child, say a one-year-old or a three-year-old, and you're caring for them. How, how can you go work? So there, again, many countries, South Africa put in some social protections for care, several other countries did where, and now the World Bank has a care incentive fund. Um, there was a great social entrepreneur program uh, that I love called Kidogo in Kenya, where a woman founded it and they started these small childcare centers and they basically became micro enterprises that other women started. And so you'd get, you know, kids could go there, they could learn and mom could go off and work in the informal sector and it was very inexpensive. So I think there are models out there that we need to scale up. And then the last thing is data. You're gonna hear me talk about data probably, and I love data, sorry, I'm a data geek, but 
The reason I care, you're here about me talk about it for the rest of my life. Why do I care about it? Because unless we know things work, we don't want to make further investments. So even as a, a co-chair of a foundation, if I'm going to put another $500,000 in something, I want to know it worked. Yeah. If I'm the government of Nigeria, I want to know it worked. If I'm the global fund, I want to know it worked. So we have to collect data on women's lives and livelihoods. There's some great surveying going on out there. Kenya's doing a time use study. Some of the global surveys are changing so they're not biased. We're not just asking about men's income. We're actually asking about women's income and where they get it. That data is gonna make us smarter and help us make the right investments. Absolutely, and, and, and the data is about whether it works in the circumstances in which it needs to work and at the scale at which it needs to work. Some things may look like they work if you have them in a controlled situation, right. but you try and scale them up, do they still work? And I think getting that, that kind of data is gonna be key to making the right decisions. So, Minister, I want to just get your take on this sort of, you know, the cash care data framing. Um, you can see why it's so compelling, but you as a finance minister are also facing a set of macro constraints. Melinda mentioned debt, and that's kind of one issue, but just access to finance more generally and the budget pressures are strong. How do you see measures that a country like Nigeria or others that are in a similar situation can take to follow through on empowering women uh, including through providing not just cash, but also support for care and, and getting better data on them. And what do you think the rest of the world can do, including the development agencies, to support you most effectively in that effort? Well, um, so let me uh, also, it would be remiss of me to be here and not uh, also extend the gratitude of the government and people of Nigeria to build the Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, because of the support we've had from Gavi and Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, we have a very, very good and healthy level of immunization mm -hmm. for our children. And um, investment in health is actually investment in the economy. And also, there was a time that we um, rebased our economy and then we were classified, reclassified from low income to medium income. And Gavi and uh, uh, the partners in the group said we now have to exit the support. And after we negotiated, we were given an eight-year extension. So that means a lot because that is monies that uh, the, the cost of immunization to us will have been like triple what we are spending. And that is more money we could apply to the other healthcare sector uh, as, as well as for, for education. So that's very meaningful. So whatever progress we, we've made in the economy uh, is also directed, mm. uh, directly mm. related to your activities and we appreciate that. We also appreciate the importance of data. Nigeria has one of the fastest growing social investment programs in the world today. It's a very young program, but so far uh, we have up to about 15 million people enrolled in uh, a school feeding program that is designed to mm -hmm. retain children in school, but also to uh, provide one nutritious meal a day. So we saw children performing better and staying longer in school. We have a conditional cash transfer program, which is funded by government, but also there's some funding from the World Bank that enables us to provide uh, 5,000 Naira per month to caregivers, and the caregivers were almost 95% uh, women. During the COVID, we have had the opportunity to upgrade that scheme. We developed through a rapid response register and expanded the register, which was just 2 million for cash transfers to about 12 million households, not mm -hmm. people. So that's about 30 million people that you have their data and you're able to uh, transfer cash to them digitally. And, and it meant we were able to now support more people in a very, very um, uh, speedy uh, fashion. We had continued to uh, in increase our investments on education, on health. We have civil society, some of them I see in this room, mm -hmm. that are pushing us to attain some certain percentages. 
And I always say it's uh, the attaining 10% of your national spending on health is not an event. It's for us, it's a journey. And we're moving very gradually but surely towards that journey. The fiscal situation is very, is very tight, to say the least. But at least in the economic uh, planning arm of the government, we are very conscious of the fact that investment in the social sector is also an economic investment. Because if you have people that are well and healthy, they are more productive. Uh, if you have kids that are well and healthy, they are able to be educated much better. COVID-19 brought uh, hardships on the economy. And um, for us, revenue was constrained, not only because of the COVID, but because the crude oil price also crashed. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we had, so we're dealing with a double, uh, double shock, and it means revenues became very, very tight. Uh, uh, oil and gas revenues went down by as much as 60, uh, 60, 60 percent. So we had to make a number of uh, very hard choices, uh, defer, deferring some expenditure to prioritize spending on health. Mm -hmm and on the uh, social uh, development sector. But it also meant we had to borrow more than we planned. Right. And as a result of that borrowing, we now have debt levels that are higher than what was planned, a deficit uh, requirement by uh, the Fiscal Responsibility Act is that it shouldn't be more than 3% of uh, GDP. We are now at 4.5%. And uh, it's... The debt size itself for a country the size of the, an economy the size of Nigeria is still healthy at at uh, at around thirty percent, so it's still very healthy. But we're struggling with servicing debt because revenues are not growing as fast as expenditure is growing, and uh, so far we've been able to cope with all of our debt service as well as with servicing of government. But we do need to find. Uh, so we're concentrating all of our efforts, and some of my colleagues are here in this room, to just expand and increase our revenue and to continuously prioritize spending to growth-critical sectors that will uh, enhance our productivity and also enhance our capacity to collect more taxes. Right. And raising domestic revenue is also a journey, as mm. you're saying. Yes, yeah. it's because not Because I think... So many countries in Africa you know, are making progress, but sometimes you have two steps forward and then one step back because you get hit by a shock and, and then you mm -hmm. have to just carry on on that uh, path. Yeah, the shock we have now, the Ukraine-Russia yeah. war, is costing a lot of, uh, it's costing the global economy. In the case of Nigeria, an oil producing country, but also an oil, an oil uh, refined products importing country, it has, we, we have very high energy prices uh, because we're importing uh, refined products. We're spending the benefits from the... Higher crude prices. Yes, on the for the yeah. imports. So we're not seeing more, yeah. more revenues. And then, and then the fertilizer and food. Uh, and, and then and fertilizer. Well, in our case, yeah. actually fertilizer yeah. because we produce a yeah. lot of food locally. Mm -hmm. But fertilizer also has taken a heat. The cost of yeah. fertilizer is high. The cost of transport is high because of cost of uh, uh, diesel mm -hmm. and yeah. uh, food, uh, food prices have gone up as a result. Yeah. Jennifer, can I just come to you, please, to... I mean, the Biden administration has positioned care as, uh, as part of some essential infrastructure uh, in its domestic policy priorities. You mentioned that. I want to ask, to what extent do you think this could also be complemented in the foreign policy? And particularly if you think about the Build Back Better World initiative, to what extent can one begin to feed the same thinking and analysis in there? Um, I think it's very much front and center. Um, so just to, to pause a moment to talk about the, the domestic side for, for a minute. Um, you know, as, as you heard earlier, um, women's economic security and labor force participation has um, really been under strain because of, the, um, because of the pandemic and very much a focus of our recovery efforts both at, here, at home and abroad. 
Um, you know, in the United States, the Biden administration has created 6.4 million jobs. Um, and uh, while your point is exactly right that um, women lost jobs it, in higher numbers at the beginning of the pandemic and have been more slow to come back, I mean, women's labor force participation in this country alone, and I know the um, the issue is the same in, in most, if, if not all countries around the world, but right here it was at a 33 year low. Mm. And so that mm. was for all obvious reasons, um, a very um, important uh, part of our objective in, in pandemic recovery. Um, one thing that is good is in those 6.4 million jobs, what we've seen in the last couple of months of, of job recovery and women's labor force uh, participation is those numbers are finally coming up. So we're really beginning to see the results of the investment. Uh, what is that? What is the, the secret sauce there? What, what, you know, what do I think is happening both in the private and the public sector is uh, not solely. I mean, you know, one important thing was that cash early on right. again here in this country as well as part of the American Rescue Plan, those direct payments, child tax credit, putting money in the hands of, of American families um, and in many cases, women controlling the, those assets, but care. Um, and so, you know, part of the American Rescue Plan, again, was a $39 billion investment in our child care infrastructure. Um, $24 billion of that was uh, what was called the Child Care Stabilization Fund, which actually gave money to child care providers to stay open, to pay their workers, um, all of that. And every piece of that has an analog. Um, globally, um, and it's very much part of the work that we have been doing. Next week, to to um, to respond specifically on um, Build Back Better World, you know, as I think people know, but just a, a refresher on right. that, um, it's a, a investment in low and middle income countries on infrastructure, um, and it has four pillars: um, health, climate, uh, technology and gender equality, mm -hmm. um, and that's not an accident. The, the reason is you know, what we've been hearing today, which is if you actually want to yeah. see economic recovery, you need to focus on gender equality. So a piece of that, which we'll be able to talk in more detail about next week, is a care infrastructure incentive fund, which um, will be a partnership and driven by um, the World Bank, the Gates Foundation, a number of partner countries, um, and you know, we, it's, it's the, the first investment. We're going to build it out. We're going to um, extend an invitation to, to other countries to join to make those vital investments. Um, and that will enable um, the, th this partnership to invest in that care infrastructure, invest in the human infrastructure, the, the humans that that um, deliver that care. And I also think, you know, uh, as you noted at the outset, the other really important piece here is to think about the informal care sector. So while we are ensuring that there is paid care available so that people, particularly women, but people can get to their jobs, um, we also need to really um, ensure that we are supporting and investing in um, the informal care economy as well. Great, and, and we will uh, set up a session once you're able to, once it's been released, to bring together the people who have been organizing it to share the details and, and just make sure that everybody who's interested in it has a chance to, to learn more about that. Because that does seem like such an important initiative going forward and we'd all like to hear more about it. Mm -hmm. Okay, I want to make sure that we actually get a chance to get questions from our colleagues here and from those who are online. So if you could raise your hands, I already see some hands coming up. All right, one, two, three. Why don't I take three, three questions and then we will um, I'll get those done first and then we can see if you have time for another round. And also, I want to encourage my colleagues who are monitoring questions online to please share those as well. So I think we had a person mm -hmm. sitting there in the front. Oh, is that Ratna sitting there with the mask on? Yeah. Okay, right. <laughs> uh, let's start with you, and then I think we had one over here. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Masood. This is it is really an honor to hear all of you speak. and. Uh, you know, I'm new to this area, but uh, it's a really important area. So I'm at the IMF. 
Uh, and Melinda, you made a very powerful statement right at the start, and I loved it. And you said, shame on us for not looking at women in economic development. And you know what I wanted to do now is I want to add one more dimension to what you said so you remember it yeah. next time you speak. You know, studies at the IMF, uh, they have shown that increasing women's economic participation, which includes access to finance, yeah and digital economy, and I myself have done work on that area, and in leadership positions, it goes hand in hand with higher macroeconomic and financial stability. Okay. Now, why am I pointing this out so vehemently? It is because, you know, the influential policymakers, the finance ministers, and the central bank governors, they really care about this issue. So I think we need to repeat this, and I'm very happy to send everybody all the studies we've done, uh, but it's important. It goes beyond development. Uh, it's also about resilience. And my question to you, uh, and this is something I find frustrating again and again, now that I'm getting deeper into it, is there's always a crisis, an urgent issue that comes up. Mm. And you know the long-term structural issues that are so important, like gender, they tend to get sidetracked because we have, you know, limited resources to look at. Stuff. So how do you ensure that the world remains focused and continues working on this? So that's my question to everybody. Thank you. Let me just take a couple more, mm -hmm. then come back to you. I think we have Daddy in the front here. Yep. Honourable Minister, panel members, thank you so much. Um, my name's Emily Braley and I'm a development economist and I worked on the team at Eurasia Group who did yeah. the study for you, uh, Melinda, which was a real pleasure. Um, I'm not going to take the shame on us comment <laughs> as happily as you. Uh, I've also been in this space for 22 years mm -hmm. and we have been talking about women. Female economists have been talking about yes. women. Uh, Esther Bozerup talked about yep. women in 1970. Yes. We know this, right? And many of my honorable colleagues in Africa and Latin America have mm -hmm. also been pushing. So my question is about resistance. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's a lack of data. We are investing in men every single day. The World Bank does this. The board is run by men. Our development community is run by men. And that is why we do not have investment <laughs> in women. Um, and there is a lot of resistance um, from my colleagues, my fellow colleagues in this space. And I wanted to know from the honorable members of the panel, what are the strategies that you use personally when you face resistance and also that we can deploy uh, as we do this work? Great, thank, thank you very much. And I think there was a deity right in the back <coughs> there. And then, I, then I'll add one more from here because I think you had your hand up first actually. Yeah, that lady over there. Yeah. Hello, I'm Caridad Araujo. I lead the gender work at the Inter-American Development Bank. And I have a question uh, related to Latin America and the Caribbean, which is a bit of a puzzle. It's a region that has grown. Uh, many, now it has many middle-income countries. We've achieved great uh, progress in some dimensions. Most university graduates today are women. Uh, there was an increase, although plateaued before the pandemic of, in women's labor force participation. And yet, we are at the top of other very worrying statistics, at the top of feminicides, gender-based violence, teenage pregnancies, uh, limited sexual and reproductive rights, to name a few. So my question is what, uh, and oftentimes, because we're a middle-income region, we are not prioritized in, in a lot of the global strategies uh, on gender and other financial issues. So would I see the role of partners like the US government, like the foundation, as key to our work in really pushing progress in this area. But I would like to hear from you as what you see as your role in Latin America and the Caribbean countries. Thank you. Great. Let's just take one final question here and then we'll come back to the panelists. Hello, good morning. My name is Nabila Aguele. I'm an advisor to the Honorable Minister of Finance for Nigeria. Uh, my question is directed at Melinda Gates and uh, the Center for Global Development. A lot has been said and written around the importance of having a seat at the table. Uh, mm -hmm. Part of the reason we have resistance and challenges is that the decision makers are by and large not women and therefore um, the women's inclusion and development agenda isn't reflected. Um, so th with that being said, can you speak to some of the, the models, successful models 
models you've seen for actually uh, um, achieving that. Uh, because I see a gap between intention and execution. Right. Um, and it's part of what addresses the, the resistance problem. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think there's a lot in there to unpack. <laughs> and, uh, Can I take a crack first uh, at, at I three of the questions? Because yes, they please. all, you know, yeah. you see me smiling. Yeah. The shame on the, on the community is not the economists, not the collective. The shame on is, is us who are at the seats at the table that we didn't take up that data and make action. And I think it's because we didn't have enough women with seats at the table. Right. And it, you can't do it with one woman. You, you can't do it alone in your no. country. You have to have like-minded men, and there are many men out there that are like-minded, and you have to have women, and you gotta push. And so one of the things that we're also doing now that we actually have a full gender strategy at the foundation is we're putting $100 million into women's leadership because we need to have women in many more seats of power. We need, you know, and so when I sit at the table yesterday, which many of you have done with Kristalina, you know, she used to be at the World Bank, she was number two, now she's head of IMF. It's no surprise that the IMF has a gender strategy. Christine Lagarde started it. Kristalina is deeply devoted to it, right? And so I think when you have women in seats of power and with seats at the table, they just, they have a, a slightly different lens on society because of their lived experience. That's a great thing. And so to me, we have to have more people in my own country, more minorities at the table, more women at the table, uh, like-minded men. But I just, I'll be honest, I think we've had too many men in seats of power for too long. We couldn't get the prime ministers or the presidents to pay attention to things. So until we could bring them data that says at the, ma as you just said, at the macro level, you're gonna get what you want for your economy and then women pushing. Uh, I think that was a lot of the issue and that's why I do think we have to all invest in women's leaderships across many sectors. Yeah. Um, and, and even when I look back um, at what we call soft issues, I, I, I'm an economist. Uh, my undergraduate training was an economist and also computer scientist. But what we label as soft issues versus hard issues, who decided that? I mean, soft issues are female issues and hard issues are hard economics? I don't think so. I mean, so it's just so strange to me that those labels took hold. And again, it has a lot to do with who had the seats at the table to, to lay that groundwork. The fact we don't measure Unpaid labor because a co male economist said we couldn't. That's just nonsense. You can measure unpaid labor. So um, I think women's leadership is pretty fundamental. And you're seeing, and I will say, when you sit at seats at the table now, I'm seeing more women yeah, at seats at the table. Yeah. And it's fabulous. And so we, There's another, one of another them. Another women leader. <laughs> right? So, so, minister, so it's good to have a seat on the table, but it's, it's more powerful to have a seat on the table and data to aid your work. Because not only because you're most likely even as a woman you're a minority on the table. So unless you have compelling data to carry as many people along as possible, you won't be able to get those reforms to happen. We're able to uh, do the work we're doing by using data to show that when you invest in uh, programs and projects that affect women is actually greater benefit on the economy. So most people that are in leadership will listen to um, an argument that makes an economic sense. Mm -hmm. So unless we put it like that, then we are not so much had. Un unpaid care is, uh, is a very fundamental problem in, in developing economies. At least in my country, in Nigeria, there are too many women that just stay at home, just taking care of the home and not being able to use their capacities to do more, to earn something for them, for, for themselves. So this example uh, of uh, creating uh, uh, care centers is a good one and we'll see how it works. And also the example that you have for the Gender Policy Council is something that our Minister of Women Affairs has been toying with and has spoken to me about and she was saying we need this woman, this minister, um, all of them. I said, no, look, we need some key ministers, whether they're men or women, mm -hmm. because it's important to have the right mix on, 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 the, on the table. And I told her that we can start with a committee that works from day one. A council means you have to go through several levels of approval before 
it gets uh, it gets affected. But we will look at what you've done and learn from that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I would love to okay. continue that. <laughs> yes. um, and but to jump in on yeah. on leadership and representation before we leave that. Um, f first of all, I think what both of you have said is exactly right, which is leadership matters, representation matters. Um, you know, the, the the notion that in the Biden administration, first of all, that there is a gender policy council. Um, and that you know we have a cabinet for the first time ever in American history that is gender equal. There are 11 female members, including the vice president. I forgot her. There's a female vice president. Mm -hmm. um, that <laughs> absolutely matters. Um, and um, and I also totally agree with you that you that representation is not sufficient. That you know. Being, being, having the data, I would actually have said it slightly differently, but yours is better, which is, you know, in answer in a personal way to, to your question, which is, you know, what, how do you, what do you do when you face resistance? Um, I am always better prepared, um, working harder, and I am stubbornly determined. I, I won't go away, um, which, you know, my, my colleagues at the White House probably, you know, roll their eyes when I leave the room, but it seems to be working. Um, but I think those things uh, really matter. And the other piece I would add, um, which I think, you know, again, to take some responsibility, I think we don't always do well um, as a community working on gender equality and gender equity is not only finding like-minded um, men to bring to the table, but not only talking to ourselves. Right. You know, so a project that I was honored to work on, which I'm sure most people um, would have turned away in horror at, and I worked closely with my colleague who's here, Rachel Vogelstein, was under Secretary Clinton integrating gender throughout the work of the State Department. So what did we do? We didn't just work in the office that we, um, we were working in, which was the Office of Global Women's Issues. We, under her leadership, figured out how to integrate this work through every bureau, every embassy. Um, and one of the things that we discovered along the way, and use the data to make the case, um, sort of back to your point, to make the case of why it mattered to them. If you're working on conflict prevention, why should I care about gender equality? You're working about de on development, why should I care about gender equality? So we came with the data and we actually helped them figure out how to integrate gender throughout their strategic planning and budgeting, their management and training, their programming and their evaluation. You know, if you didn't, back to where we started, if you didn't measure it, you didn't do it. So all of that mattered, but what was really interesting was the number of people who maybe on first glance thought, I don't think I work on gender equality, when they started to talk about the work that they did and, the, and their commitment, it was clear that they actually did and acknowledged that they in fact worked on gender equality. And, and the one thing I'd just add is that actually bringing together this point of data and leadership, we need better data on the extent to which in the leadership of different organizations you do have a uh, presence of women at the seat mm -hmm. at the table. And I think uh, my colleagues uh, actually recently here at CGD have done uh, two pieces of work. One was to actually look at precisely that, just look mm -hmm. across the board at, uh, at nonprofit organizations, starting, you know, looking at ourselves first and seeing how do we stack up uh, in terms of leadership. And the second uh, was to look at the international financial organizations and did a survey of them looking again, both in terms of their internal policies uh, that supported and empowered women, and whether their external, their actual operational work mm. then reflected that. And I think it was, I was a little bit unsure of how that would play out because I felt people would get defensive about the results. But surprisingly, and, and I was pleasantly surprised that even the agencies that didn't do so well came to a presentation, participated in it, and said, look, this is the reason we learned this, this is what somebody else is doing, and we're going to take that away and do that. So the point about data mm. actually translates even into this space in a way that's uh, very powerful. And there's, there's a couple other things you just have to note. One is that the data can be dangerous because there have been too many studies that are done, you know, to your point about being you know, one of the few, too many studies look at, you know, there's one woman on that board or three women on that board. Oh, it didn't work. So therefore, that means that 
having women's <laughs> representation see. isn't important. So you have to be really careful yeah, that the, the data isn't pointing in the wrong direction because it isn't done properly. Um, and, um, and, and really to understand that this is, you know, this is sort of the, the premise, but it's insufficient. It's yeah. necessary, but not sufficient mm -hmm. to have women at the table. Um, it's also important to make sure that those workplaces or wherever women need to be um, are hospitable, safe, fair, um, and that they Absolutely. can thrive and, and um, make their contribution. So true. All right, I think we are running out of time now. So I just want to take this moment to, to really thank, first of all, all three of you mm -hmm. for having taken the time during a very busy week to come and uh, participate in this panel. I want to thank all of you who came and joined us in person. And I also want to thank all of you who are uh, watching this uh, online. Uh, and obviously, in the post-COVID world, the ratios of the people who watch online compared to the people who are in the room have shifted dramatically. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, a great welcome to all of them. So if you could all join me, please, and those of you online can join virtually uh, in thanking our panelists for, for this great presentation.